I think even though there's a perception that uh, transit and rideshare are natural enemies, I actually think they're natural complements to each other. And I, I think there is a world in which um, the, the nimbleness of a rideshare uh, coupled with the hardscape of a transit system give us a perfect complement to allow even more democratization of transportation. Uh, and, and partnerships uh, are going to have to emerge between these industries in order for both of them to be as strong in the future as necessary. Hi everyone, welcome to the Optimistic Outlook. I'm Barbara Humpton, CEO of Siemens USA. Throughout this podcast series, we've been taking a look at how things react in times of disruption. And you know, things tend to ungel. And there's this moment when we get to ask ourselves, how should things really work? Well, today we're gonna to get a chance to dive deep into the American transportation system. And we've got the expert support of Anthony Fox, who served as the US Secretary of Transportation from 2013 to 2017. He also served as the mayor of Charlotte, his hometown. And right now he's serving as the chief policy officer for Lyft. So he's got deep expertise in the subject. Join me as we hear this optimistic outlook of the future of American transportation. Anthony Fox, welcome to the podcast. Great to be with you, Barbara, thank you. You know, your own life has been intertwined with transportation. I'm told that your great grandfather drove a truck and sent all 13 of his children to college. I understand your grandparents were educators and they certainly understood how the expense of a car could stretch a family budget. You've now had the opportunity to regulate all trucks in the United States. And now at Lyft, you are actually inventing the future of transportation, of mobility. How have your own personal experiences affected your perspectives on transportation? Well, thanks for the question. It takes me back to uh, many conversations I would have with my, my grandmother about her parents. And, you know, as you point out, my, my great grandfather drove a truck he hauled things in in rural North Carolina and uh, used that truck to raise a, a large family. But this was back in the early um, 19 teens, 1920s. And it was a time when in, in my family, they were still feeling the sting of Jim Crow law and, and segregation. And um, transportation was always a struggle for people, notwithstanding the fact that, that my family at least had the means um, traveling through the South, uh, oftentimes folks would have to um, not be able to stay in hotels or uh, have to use the bathroom by the roadside because the bathrooms were not available to them. Um, and so I, I grew up hearing these stories and understanding that uh, for me and, and from my point of view, that transportation was among those areas that um, that, that needed to be paid attention to, that people were sometimes uh, left out um, of the conversation. And uh, historically, some of those people were family members for me. And so um, when I became transportation secretary, it was important to me um, to represent the issue well, meaning that we do need to build in this country. We do need to um, to, to, to make sure transportation is available to everyone. But we also need to make sure that we are uh, uh, thinking differently about the future than we did in the past and that we build systems that are well integrated and that allow everyone, no matter who they are, where they come from, to have a shot at the American dream. In episode seven, we actually talked about how the electric grid was originally designed for reliability. And now we have to really rethink it and focus on sustainability. And it, it strikes me that there's a parallel here with the goals in transportation. There used to be a focus on throughput. How many vehicles can we get from point A to point B? And, and as Secretary of Transportation, you actually took a long-term view of this, looking out to 2045 to reimagine transportation, thinking differently. What are the outcomes that we should all be keeping in mind as we look forward? Yeah, um, it's a great point. You know, back then we were we were expecting to see a sustained period of ur ur urbanization uh, of of people flocking into cities, 
living more densely. Um, we'll see whether COVID interrupts that or, or permanently changes that trend. Um, but when you have that kind of density, there are a lot of things you can do to promote sustainability. You, you don't have to, for example, um, build out a lot of greenfield infrastructure. You can, you can build more densely in the interior of cities and, and have more vertical development than what I would call horizontal development across um, larger landmass. You can uh, use the existing street grid, you know, uh, rather than having to build out new streets and put in new, uh, new uh, wastewater facilities and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of leverage that comes with, with densifying our cities. And there's a strong connection between the transportation aspects of that as well as the housing aspects of it. Um, but, you know, I think also in terms of sustainability, uh, what's really important, I think, is, is uh, number one, the, the connection between land use and, and transportation. You know, bad zoning will get you sprawl and good zoning will get you more of that density. Um, the criticality in our large and medium cities of transit and having good sound uh, transit systems in place. Um, those systems are also threatened by COVID right now. Uh, a lot of them are struggling with operational costs, but hopefully we can dig ourselves out of it. Um, and then the transportation system overall needs to, needs to be clear about what the trends are. So, you know, we were seeing, um, you know, things like electrifying the, the fleet, you know, putting in infrastructure so that uh, electric vehicles can become uh, more, more prevalent. Um, some of that was done through the Recovery Act. We still have a long way to go um, there. Uh, thinking about how things get to us, um, you know, with the advent of, of online shopping, um, it's interesting, maybe prescient that, that the rise of the internet and uh, e-commerce happened before we got into this pandemic. I'm not sure what we'd be doing if we didn't have access to that today. But given that that exists, it's putting a huge load on our freight systems. If you look out in the next 30 years at what, what our rail systems are going to be taxed by in terms of just capacity, it's, it's severe. And uh, now that you're starting to see companies like Amazon, who are, um, you know, they're building their own air fleets, uh, they're, they're um, making adaptive reuses of, of airports that are underutilized. Um, and maybe that's good over time, but they're taxing the capability of the USPS, FedEx, uh, and, and DHL. So they're building their own independent system. So what does that mean for us going forward? How much, how much is that going to be working in a, in a different parallel path uh, to the existing transportation system versus uh, using the, the system that the rest of us use. And then there's technology and just the abundance of new technologies that are coming into transportation, everything from drones. There's a small company called Zipline. I was able to visit as transportation secretary that's, that's uh, working to transport medical supplies into rural America and other parts of the world. Uh, everything from that to Hyperloop to uh, to the autonomous vehicle, all of these inputs into our system are coming, and the question is, can we can we leverage them to make our transportation system uh, more efficient, to give us uh, the ability to get places faster, but also safer? Oh, wow, yeah, what a perspective! And hey, a quick plug: Siemens actually Siemens software was used by Zipline to design oh, cool. their their uh, aircraft. And so it, we're really proud of what innovators are doing using Siemens automation tools in order to really embrace the future and, and help bring us into this new era. Um, and I'll come back for just a moment to the subject of cities, because it's true that we know that there has been a trend toward urbanization for decades, and we anticipate that going on further into the future. As a matter of fact, Siemens recently conducted a survey with the support of the Harris Poll with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and we talked to mayors across the country about their perspectives on economic recovery, steps that are needed next for, for our overall health. And what we heard overwhelmingly from mayors is the need to invest in infrastructure. I know that when you were mayor of Charlotte, you actually used use transportation as one of those tools to spur economic development. And I'd love to get your perspective on how investments in transportation could be helpful to us in this moment. 
Yeah, you're talking to somebody who uh, was crazy enough during the Great Recession in a city of Charlotte that was uh, highly, highly, highly tied to the financial sector uh, and suffering as a result of, of that particular recession. Uh, proposed the largest transportation bond in the city's history and also pushed the city to um, complete its largest capital project ever, which was a light rail line um, in, in, in the uh, downtown area up to the University of North Carolina. Um, that was, uh, you know, I think people in cities naturally get that when, when, when the economy is really, really bad, um, government has to find a way to step in and, and, and help, help lift up the community and, and provide, frankly, a base level of, of, of job creation that allows communities to recover. And it's a bonus if those efforts also contribute to a longer term um, uh, vision of a city. And uh, I think transportation investments are incredibly critical for, for cities because, uh, you know, another thing that's happening in our country demographically is that um, people are changing, even though they're urbanizing, they're changing, we're changing where the job growth is concentrating. So, you know, a generation ago, people were flocking out of cities. And before that, people were going into like, you know, the cities in the Northeast and the Midwest. And you know, there's still some growth in those places, but we're also seeing the emergence of places like Austin, uh, you know, uh, cities in the western part of uh, of the U.S. around Phoenix and California and, and where I'm from in North Carolina and, and Florida. And those cities are typically places that haven't had strong uh, investments in things like transit, and they need to make those investments. And so I, I actually think over the next, you know, 20, 30 years, you're going to see uh, places that have never been strong with fixed rail transit systems start to get focused on that because they need it. And that's just one example. That's a great example. And I know that in your Beyond Traffic report and looking out at 2045, you really found that our current approach to U.S. transportation would fall short of meeting our future challenges. And one of the things you've spotlighted and, and we've talked about, uh, we've touched on here, is this concept of racial inequalities. Talk to us a little bit further about this and, and what needs to be changed. Yeah, I, I think there's more more room for discussion and action on um, repairing this country's racial um, history um, today than there was even when I was in the Obama administration because of some of the recent uh, acts of uh, police brutality that people have seen. And I think the country recognizes there's a need. The question is, what do we do about it? And I think to understand the depths of it, you have to go and look at what was done. Um, during the 1950s, um, the highway system was developed really um, around getting farm to mark, farm uh, products to market in, in our cities. Um, and there wasn't a lot of concern for those communities that at that time could not vote largely um, and couldn't participate in public input sessions and things. So in almost every city in this country, um, there are highways that run through what were previously uh, minority communities. And uh, people still remember that. That memory is still very fresh. Air airports have been designed in low-income areas for quite some time. And uh, the air traffic has typically flowed over low-income communities. Um, and so... You know, I think as we think about um, how to how to make the transportation system more context sensitive and and less weaponized, uh, there are several things that need to happen. Number one, you know, as we think about big or small infrastructure packages, the public input system has to improve. We've got to make it more user friendly, uh, make it use more common language when we're talking about projects and not transportation ease, but also making the accessibility to meetings and, you know, the, the forms that we now have with Zoom uh, are, are great. Uh, but if we still have a digital div divide, that's uh, still going to be a problem. So, can, you know, can we do a large broad broadband um, investment across this country to connect rural and urban uh, low-income people to this system? Um, 
I also uh, think that we've got to we've got to have a generation of projects that connect these historically disconnected areas. And good examples of that uh, I can think of the the light rail project in uh, Crenshaw, Los Angeles, which is uh, uh, not only an example of a project that that's gone through a historically low income area, but it's an example of a project that used the local hiring program that we started in the Obama administration, where people who lived in that neighborhood could actually work on the project, which which helped with job creation. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can do. I think what we can't do, and in 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 a you know in the near future, is I think we can't keep having a conversation about it. I think it's more of question of digging in and actually starting to move some of these projects. And the last thing I'd say is um, we can we can tear down some projects too. Um, there, there are some projects in this country that I think could be torn down. I was having a conversation yesterday about I-81 in Syracuse, which is one example of what I was talking about before. And there is an active conversation in communities across this country about you know whether some of these freeways that were placed in the urban core are actually providing a travel advantage and whether whatever travel advantage there may be is outweighed by um, some of the uh, obstruction that highway pr provides and, and the, the, the need for open space and affordable housing and other things. So I do think that conversation is happening. Seattle just took down their viaduct, put it below ground. They've opened up their, uh, their, their, uh, the, 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 uh, the shore line in the, the main part of the city. And uh, I think there are projects out there that could be exemplars of, of what I'm talking about. It's exciting to think about people really considering all the options as they and, and thinking about equality, equity as part of the equation. Um, but I've heard you describe, uh, you know, the, the ability to get a, a big infrastructure project approved is like hitting a grand slam home run. You've got to get all of the stakeholders aligned. Everybody's got to be in place and then everything has to work together. I, you know, I actually... <laughs> I guess my question I'd love to ask you is, do you have ideas for speeding things up, making this move more rapidly? Well, look, I think I think most presidents miss the opportunity. And, uh, you know, regardless of the outcome of this coming election, my hope is, is that uh, the president will will take the opportunity at the very beginning of, of a term and put a large transportation package out there and 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 force Congress to do something about it. Um, what's happened in recent years, honestly, is that the uh, the pay for has become more important than the the output. And uh, as a result, uh, White Houses have become more and more reluctant to to put out large transportation packages because they then have to explain how they pay for it, and invariably it gets into a question of tax increases, whether it's the gas tax or some other tax. And um, that makes them gun shy. And so they've really left it to Congress, um, which is never a good idea for something as big and bold as this country needs. So my hope is, is that very early in the next, uh, you know, next uh, term, we see a big package put out there at the very beginning, perhaps tied to COVID relief, perhaps separate, but something needs to happen for us to get off the dime. And, 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 and I also hope, frankly, that the policies that are put into a new transportation package reflect where we need to go as a country and not where we've been, because there is a there is a, a real uh, uh, magnetism to just taking the last highway bill and slapping a new number on it and calling it innovation, and that is not what this country needs right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we all view this as a moment of intense disruption, and it gives us this great opportunity to rethink things. If we're going to spend a dollar, let's spend it on something that is going to serve us well in the future. So let's shift our focus a moment then to technology, because it, you know it, it's true that uh, there is a lot of concrete and steel that's going to be required for infrastructure development. But we also have the opportunity to use new thoughts, business models, technologies. So like ride sharing, 
uh, we've been talking about equality and I'd, I'd love to understand how you view the role of ride sharing. I understand that you Lyft stepped in early in the pandemic and helped ensure that medical supplies were delivered, for instance. And how do you think ride sharing is going to evolve in these coming years? Yeah, I, I, it's become a really important innovation in terms of equity and democratizing transportation. Um, uh, growing up in my neighborhood in Charlotte, um, I couldn't even get a pizza delivered in my neighborhood because no no company wanted to come into to where I lived. And um, the same is true with taxi companies, frankly. Um, you, 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 there are some neighborhoods that have historically been very difficult to get a ride. And what this um, what this industry has done is it's made it available to anybody, basically. Um, and that's been an incredible change. Um, there are transit deserts in this country where the transit systems don't actually get as close to people as makes it usable. So that's a that's been a challenge. So I, I think that as this industry evolves, there are a couple of directions that make a really good sense for uh, for growth. Number one is I think even though there's a perception that uh, transit and rideshare are natural enemies, I actually think they're natural complements to each other. And I, I think there is a world in which um, the, the nimbleness of a ride share uh, coupled with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the hardscape of a transit system give us a perfect complement to allow even more democratization of transportation. Uh, and, and partnerships uh, are gonna have to emerge between these industries in order for both of them to be as strong in the future as necessary. Um, so I think that's a big, a big one. Um, you know, we'll see how how quickly automation comes into play. There, 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 there are companies out there that that aren't rideshare companies, but have uh, autonomous technology that they're looking to deploy. Um, there are um, rideshare companies that are experimenting with uh, with with autonomy. Autonomy is coming, and uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see all the different business models that uh, that attempt to capture people's imagination as that comes along. But I, you know, I think even the traditional OEMs are, are working towards uh, automation and trying to figure out whether they become sellers to fleets or whether they have their own independent systems that allow us to access. Um, so I think there are a lot of directions that we're going to see come forward, but the most, the ones that I'm most excited about are ones that, that allow us to live um, close together, but uh, also allow us to get places uh, wherever they happen to be. And I, I, I think my dream is that um, anybody who lives in any part of this country has an app, and that app will give them multiple ways to get from A to B, and will be able to seamlessly allow that trip to occur in a single payment. Um, and I, I think that is... Uh, I think a lot of people want that. The question is who 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 controls that information, who who sets that up, and I think that's one of the big questions we'll be asking for the next five to ten years. Yeah, let me pull the thread on this for just a moment because, in fact, Siemens worked with the Department of Transportation and in Columbus actually uh, delivered an app that is giving people that experience, uh, the end to end insight into the transportation system, the ability to have a single ticket to then move anywhere about the, the city and the region. Um, and, and all of that is being enabled by uh, this partnership with government. As Secretary of Transportation, you certainly got us started on thinking about that framework for the future. I'd love to hear your view about the right relationship between business and government in this regard. Yeah, it, I think it's well. First of all, I'm I'm really pleased that you all are are working with the city of Columbus. It was the winner of our Smart City Challenge, and um, I think a lot of innovations happening around the country, but particularly in Columbus, it's it hopefully will be a great proof point of of how technology, transportation, and the future of cities come together. Um, to your question. Uh, I think particularly at a time like this where there's there's a lot of innovation available um, and cities are stressed in a, in a number of places. They're stressed by congestion. They're stressed by revenue declines. They're stressed by, um, uh, you know, a lot of the maladies we, we've talked about. So 
I think government has to set up opportunities for uh, technology to, to help problem solve. And I think, and I'll give you an example in a second, I think the process of that starts to teach business how to help cities problem solve. So I'll use the Smart City Challenge as an example. Um, we, we put $40 million together um, and we joined with the Vulcan Foundation, Paul Allen's group, uh, to, uh, to put, they put another $10 million in. And we, we said to medium-sized cities across the country, okay, show us your plans for how you can use technology to solve your problems. And the, 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 we had 12, 12 sets of issues that we were most concerned about, um, including sustainability, including electrifying the fleet, including freight movement, including congestion reduction, including equity. There were, there were 12 criteria, but we didn't tell them how to solve it. We just said, these are the things we're interested in. Tell us how you would use technology to, to solve it. And we got 72 applications from all over the country, from San Francisco to Denver to Columbus. Um, there were all kinds of uh, plants, Pittsburgh. And what excited us was that once we gave those governments a reason to come up with plans, they did it. And once they had the plans, they were then able to start implementing them, whether they won the challenge or not. So um, uh, Columbus won. And, uh, you know, I think they are off to the races and doing some great things. By the way, they leveraged another $450 million to, to implement their plan. So uh, that $40 million of federal money was, was leveraged pretty well. But I think the point is, is that the model of setting up um, performance-based grant programs that then give cities and uh, places across this country a reason to create the demand for the types of products they need will help the business sector respond better because a lot of times what I've seen is businesses that have like a solution. I can't tell you how many parking meters people tried to sell me when I was mayor. Um, and, you know, sometimes, yeah, it may be a great solution, but for various reasons, the transactions cost of, of changing out things or running through the procurement process are just too great. But, but, so, but I think the federal government in particular can, can sort of push cities into a position where they have the means to sort of start changing the demand cycle. And as that happens, the business and the technology will be responsive. And I think as that happens more, business will learn more what kinds of things the cities need. So I, I think that relationship is critical, but I, I think the cities need more uh, resources to be able to generate the demand that will then um, help help both get, get better. Hope that makes sense. I think that makes a great deal of sense. And I love the idea that sort of the prize mentality spurs action, whether or not one wins the prize. It gets the creative juices flowing and, and, and leads to change. So, Anthony, we've covered a lot of ground. We've got technology. We've got regulation and the relation of business and government. We have response to so many changes that are happening in, in our world and in our societies. But but if you were able to drive success in all of the arenas you've been talking about, tell us about the future that's possible in your mind. I think the future is, is so incredibly bright. I imagine someone who's sitting somewhere in America being able to take an app and decide they want to go to any destination in this country and be able to, to get that trip designed and it, it might take them on a bike and it might take them uh, then on a train and it might then transfer to a ride share and then maybe an airplane. But the trip is paid for one time and the person's trip is seamless. I think, I think that level of convenience is within our grasp. And I think it's something that we can, we can see happen in the future. I also believe that we have a responsibility as a generation to, to transfer uh, the advantages we've had. Uh, we, we, we have, for most of our lives, uh, those of us who are 40 plus have experienced um, faster travel times at some point. And we are about to pass on slower travel times to, a, to a ne another generation of Americans uh, for the very first time. And I think we have a responsibility to, to not do that. And so that means we have to be smarter, as you said earlier, 
smarter about connecting transportation and land use and, you know, using the existing uh, street grid uh, more, uh, you know, more thoughtfully, uh, not uh, trending, not uh, against trying to create more greenfield development and, and, and really trying to make our cities work better. And, and that leads me to the last point, which is um, our, our political system is, uh, is incredibly complicated when it comes to transportation. Um, to get big projects done, you need the federal government, the state government, and the local governments all aligning at the same time. And given elections, it often starts that way and then falls apart. So I would also like to see us come up with a list of projects that are game changers for this country, commit to funding them uh, at the federal level, and, and seeing those projects through without all of the gyrations that we go through between election cycles. And, and really giving people a sense, as we did back in the, the 50s with all the problems of the highway system, it was a point of pride for for many Americans, uh, the rail system is a point of pride for many Americans. The air system is a point of pride. We want to feel proud about our infrastructure again. And I, I really believe that this uh, generation has it within, it, within our power to, uh, to bring that, uh, that sense back to our country. Well, we are in it with you. Thank you so much, Anthony Fox. It's been a pleasure to have you on the Optimistic Outlook. Thank you. Please follow us on social media and on your favorite podcasting platform. Thank you for tuning in.